Welcome everyone, and thank you for being here. Tonight, we bring you the first in a four-part conversation series on writing home, writers on writing the places they love. Our guests this evening are Larry Burns and Nakia Cheney, but more about them in just a moment. My name is Katie Porter, and I am Executive Director of Inlandia Institute a literary and cultural arts nonprofit based in inland Southern California, where the ancestral homelands of the Cahuilla, Tongva, Luiseno, and Serrano peoples. We respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, the Inlandia region is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, and we express our gratitude to them for allowing us the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. This series of events is brought to you in partnership with the Riverside Public Library and sponsored by California Humanities. Here to tell you more about it is Joseph Garcia. Welcome, Joseph. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joseph. Um, thank you, Katie, for that intro. Um, I do want, looking at the list, I do see some familiar names in there. So it's really great to see everyone again. I'm excited for this. Um, this year, Katie and one of uh, Riverside Public Library's librarians, Miriam, um, put together a, uh, about four classes for everyone to enjoy with um, some amazing authors. Uh, and I just want to give this moment to them to say thank you to both of them for their hard work that they did. Um, I know everyone's going to enjoy the seminar with Larry and with uh, Nikia. Um, it's going to be a great, great um, presentation. But I also want to let you guys know that the Riverside Public Library is still open to the public right now. We know that um, crazy things are going on in the world and we're seeing cases go up but we are still here for you. We are still here to provide a service for you. And with keeping with the theme of virtual, like we are doing right now, I just wanna let you guys know that we have virtual options for everyone as well for the library. We do offer you the ability to check out iPads so you can um, do all your e-reading and e-audio books right online. We have services for you, Cloud Library for digital books and audio books. And we have Hoopla for you which gives you audiobooks, digital books, and it also has a streaming service. So you can watch movies, videos, episodes, anything like that. It's all completely free. Um, the libraries are open Tuesday through Saturday from 11 to five. And our new main location, if you haven't visited, you should, it's awesome building, is gonna be open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. That's a great location. Um, that being said, I don't want to take too much too time. You guys are going to have a great discussion tonight. But um, as Katie said, this was funded by California Humanities, and the funding has been provided by the California Humanities and National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. So I hope everyone has a great time, and back to Katie. Katie, unmute. Ah, yes. Okay, unmuted now. We're good to go. Um, and now a few housekeeping notes. We want you to know that closed caption is available for this event via the CC icon in the lower part of your screen. Also, please note that this is a view only presentation and it is being recorded. If you have any questions for our presenters, please type them into the Q&A box and we will have a Q&A period toward the end of the hour. And now for our program, I would like to introduce Larry Burns. Larry draws inspiration and ideas from the heady mixture of sights, sounds, peoples and places of his hometown, Riverside, California. He is an active community leader, booster, and all around fan of the recreation, entertainment, arts, and culture ready to be discovered across the Inland Empire. He is a founding member of Inlandia Institute 
and he teaches English at Riverside City College and Humanities at Southern New Hampshire University. His second book with Reedy Press publisher, Secret Inland Empire, is available through Barnes and Noble and other booksellers. Nikia Cheney is the author of Us Mouth and the chapbooks Sis Fuss and Ladies Please and Three Walking, which is a science fiction uh, collection. Her latest poetry collection, To Stir And, is forthcoming from WordWorks Press in 2022. And her memoir, Ladybug, is forthcoming in 2022, also from Inlandia Books. She has served as Inlandia Literary Laureate from 2016 to 2018. And she is founding editor of Chef Poetry, an online journal for experimental poetry, and founding editor of Jammy Publishing, a publishing imprint dedicated to fostering community among poets and writers. So welcome, Nikia and Larry. We're excited to hear from you. Thank you. It's our pleasure to be here. It's uh, uh, if I could just uh, just start. I just wanted to say it's it's great to be working with Nakia. Um, you were so instrumental when I was writing my first book with Rudy Press back in sixteen. You were a workshop leader at the San Bernardino Workshop for Inlandia, and so I would bring pieces of that book I was trying to finish and uh, workshop them a little bit and you know give me some good advice. And these were this was a place based book, so uh, about Riverside. So it was really nice to have that feedback. It was good uh, to work with you in that capacity. Um, it was really uh, your, your tenure as our laureate was 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 excellent and enjoyable. And that made it uh, really particularly fun is taking that workshop with you. So it's good to uh, it's good to see you again. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm so excited to be here, Larry. I, I really I really are when you asked me to to participate in this. Um, there was no way I could say no, you know, I, I have this special relationship with Inlandia. But also I miss some of the people that I grew up with. I feel like, you know, you're from my hometown. You know what I mean? Like you're one of my, my gang <laughs> from back in the day. And, and I want to see you. I want to interact. Um, and then it, it brings back all those memories. You know, we don't think about that writing workshop, right? Like, you know, where does that go after a couple of years, 2016? You know, I mean, it, it's not too long ago, but it's long enough ago to where We've gone on and done other things and you have books and all wonderful stuff, but to go back in time and remember when we were working together. So I, I'm, I'm honored to be here. I'm, I'm actually overjoyed and honored to talk about this stuff. <laughs> yeah, and I'm glad you talked about people because people is an important part of place. You know, place isn't for me, it's not just a, um, a, a house or it's not a, you know, a, a feature that you go see and visit. Yeah. You know, uh, the people are an important integral part of it. Um, so, so I'm glad you talked about that. And, and uh, do, is, there, is there particular things that you enjoy about the people in the places that you talk about? And what are, you know, I guess I should start with, what are some of the places you use in your writing? And um, how do people factor into that for you? That's a good point, right? People and community. Like if I had a, a theme for kind of like myself, my life, it would be community. Because I do think about who lives where. Um, and what's happened where. Uh, so I'm a transplant. I was actually born in Los Angeles. Um, and, and I do in my memoir have some writings about Hollywood, which <laughs> in the 1990s is just fascinating, just completely fascinating to think about being there from living in Inglewood. Um, but then I also transplant from Los Angeles over to San Bernardino. And that was also this huge transition because San Bernardino is its own thing. <laughs> it is its own, its own special, wonderful place. And I was very young. I was only like 18, 19 years old, but it's just, it was indelible. Some of the memories of kind of being here and learning the city and learning that place and learning who I was here. And then I left, I moved, I, I moved about, three, four years ago now, um, to Santa Cruz, California, which is Northern California. And talk about a culture shock, right? Northern California is very different from Southern California. Still California though, to me. 
Yeah, it's yeah, it is still California, but it's more formal. That's the most that's the most interesting yeah. thing about it. It's a little bit more. You can go to the store in, in flip flops and <laughs> here. I don't think you could I don't think you'd want to do it in Northern California, right? So it's a little there's a little bit of more formality that's there. But I think because I've spent so much time moving from place to place and kind of seeing that, that it's nice in my own writing to talk about um, what that place is because it's a mark, it's a marker for my own memories, right? It's a marker for how I've shifted or changed or the people like you that I've met, right? So I'm, I'm curious too, is it the same for you when you think about this city or you think about the cities that you've been in, I'm curious what you would, what you would uh, have your experience in that. Uh, I would say that the people really factor into it a lot for me as well. That's the, 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 and the, you know, and, and really the, the best stories come out of the people, you know, I've, um, I grew up in Chino. I've always lived in the Inland Empire. So, and I've roughly spent half of my life in Chino and I've spent half of my life in Riverside. So I've moved around a little bit in, you know, Ontario and Upland, um, but I've always lived here. So fairly, not as, not as, uh, not as much uh, relocating as, as you had, but um, noticing the differences in, uh, in cultures, even 30, 40 miles um, is really a fun and interesting thing, you know, um, and I think part of that's driven by industries, um, you know, what you grow and, and what your what your community makes really affects kind of the people in there. So um, I don't know any personal experience, but I'm sure the, the vineyards attracted a certain type of person in Ontario, whereas in, 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 in Riverside and Redlands, the citrus industry attracted a different sort of uh, a human being, you know, or they were all people and they came from all walks of life, but their um, the, the ways they went about trying to live a life out here were, were different because of the places they lived. Um, and so I really have enjoyed um, meeting different types of people. It's always been something I was um, attracted to, I think. And I was one of those people in school that didn't belong to a clique. I belonged to almost all of the cliques. You know, I'd hang out <laughs> with the jocks and the stoners and the nerds, and I'd play Dungeons and Dragons with them. And then I go do, you know, play baseball. And, you know, so I didn't like to be pigeonholed into one particular group of friends. I always like to have new experiences like that. So, uh, and even in the community I live in now in Riverside, uh, when it comes to people, you know, depending upon where you spend your time and your, um, and your, your recreational time, it really changes who you meet and interact with. Um, you know, it, the, the people you hang out with, you know, your parents tell you that when you're a kid, you know, watch out for the people hanging around with it. And, and I've hung around with my, my youngest, child my daughter's seven years old now I've spent the last seven years really hanging around with her <laughs> as the primary caregiver and it's changed who I am as a person and it's changed my perspective on place and what I think is important you know I've definitely spent a lot more time in in the parks and in the libraries over the last seven years than I did probably the previous 20 years I lived in Riverside yeah. um so and that's driven by people that's driven by my need to meet people it's driven by my need to satisfy people so I really find, you know, coming back to place, I can't help but talk about people and, and some of the coolest stories I found, you know, hey, this building's neat. And, you know, it's great that we preserve buildings, but they're buildings. They're not people. They don't, at least to me, they don't speak to me the way that human beings speak to me. There's just such a, a variety to each one of them. They're all the same and they're all different. So you can't really get tired of people and you go a couple miles and, and they change a little bit for you. So yeah. as long as we can keep moving around even virtually like this, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful I can keep experiencing place and, and, and people in that way. Oh yeah, no, I love that. I love the idea of, of, of experiencing like place and people. But you know what I find too, Larry? I find that place makes and changes you in some like really intrinsic way right that i'm not the same person in santa cruz that i am here in san bernardino and i can't really tell you how i'm different it's just that my relationships here are different right the things that i do here are different right and san bernardino san bernardino is where i learned how to be a writer right so it's kind of, so so it always has like that really heavy when I get down here I want to write I want to do things I teach 
in Santa Cruz, right? I don't think of myself as doing as much writing in, in Santa Cruz as I do. And when the minute I get down here, it's like I start, I hear that wind, that Santa Ana wind coming in, or it's really hot because it's really cold up there. So it's really hot. And I'm like, I'm home, right? I can, I can kind of let my hair down a little bit or I can do that. And then I get up there and it's like, okay, well, I'm going to work and I want to go do this and I want to go out and I want to go to dance classes and I want to, you know, go to choir classes. So it's really interesting how I can, I find myself existing in these different bodies almost in these very different places. And I think that translates into the writing. I think you kind of have to kind of go with that and, and just let that come out and let that be. Let your relationship with whatever's around you be the relationship that it needs to be. Don't try to force it or push it. You know, be that person, let that memory come, be in that relationship in that place at that time. <laughs> 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 I can really, uh, I can really relate to that. That's a, that that's a, that's powerful. And it, uh, it, it really does. I, was there particular places in San Bernardino? You know, when I when I wrote my first book back in '08, um, I wrote it mostly at a coffee shop in Riverside that doesn't exist anymore. Um, and writing and editing, you know, on the back patio of a coffee shop for several hours a day for many months. Um, really does inform the editing and writing process itself too. You know, there were scenes where I was writing about, you know, a, a coffee, you know, an interaction in a coffee shop and, and I could literally just watch an interaction and then write it because I didn't know how to write an interaction. You know, you, you figure things out as a writer as you go along. You're like, oh, now I got, you know, how do people enter and leave rooms? You know, that, you know, how do they, <laughs> how do you end a paragraph? You know, it just, so, so it was helpful to be in a coffee shop to look over and go, okay, I'm just going to, transcribe as a journalist and then I'll get creative with it and, and flourish it a little later on mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. so in that and and that's a wonderful way in that I can really see place affecting what I've wrote what I've written but I loved what you said at the beginning and I want to ask you again uh, what is it that is different about place that affects you is it like the molecular like you're breathing in different molecules is I, it yeah is I, too spiritual you know what it might it most likely is right? Um, you know, I, I, and, and we can go like, we can go way deep with this if you want to. But like, I, I heard before that, you know how when you like you park somewhere and then you go in the store and you go shopping and you come out and you can't find your car, right? You're like, where did I park? Like, what, what, what where's my car? <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Well, I read this article about that. There's a phenomenon to it. And it's that when you move from one room to the other room, your brain records that as new events. So when you move from the parking lot with your car into the store, your brain is saying, this is another event. This is something different that's happening to you. It's not a continuous kind of, I, I parked, I went into the store, I bought some shoes, I, I'm, you know, I'm coming back out and I'm going back home, right? You know, it's not that, it's your brain is saying, I'm in the parking lot, the sun is shining on me, you know, I'm, I'm, looking around, I'm trying to get that parking space before that man gets that parking space, whatever you're doing, right? In the parking lot, you're getting out. Um, but then you go into that store, everything shifted, right? right? And I like science fiction. So I think of it like, you know, like the science fiction shift. <laughs> you, know? you know what I mean? Like you walk into another dimension, you've now entered the twilight zone. No, but you go into, you go into, a, um, you go into the store and it shifts. And now you're something else. Now there's something different. Now you're shopping. Now you're interacting with the cashiers. Now you're inside a building and the sun is not shining on you the same way. And I have to think that place is a little bit like that. And when you're yeah. in these different spots in these different places, that you're almost in these different dimensions in some ways, right? So San Bernardino, like being in San Bernardino, San Bernardino is Waterman and E Street. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, that's San Bernardino in my head, right? It's it's Waterman and E. Or, or San Bernardino is, um, it's Muskoy. And it's kind of sitting in that house when I was this really young wife with a baby and listening to the Santa Ana winds just blowing or the chickens clucking in the yard and saying, you know, 
you know, people have chickens, <laughs> you know, in 1996, like what, what is going on here? Or it's, it's walking to the little corner store and saying to myself, why does everybody have a dog? Everybody in San Bernardino has a dog. So like, that's, that's the San Bernardino Twilight Zone dimension, right? Yeah. It's Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz is that really cold beach, right? And it's, it's sitting and it's watching the children play in, in the water and having that sunlight come down. Our Santa Cruz is, you know, it's my college students, my students coming up and talking to me and telling me about this. Or it's that African drum class that I went to and I had just such a ball with, right? Or, or the choir that I started singing. That's Santa Cruz. That's not San Bernardino. But I love them both, right? Like two children, I love them both equally um but they're very different and i can't make one into the other so i i don't know so i mean i mean we're talking about place here but we went off on the tangent right. a little bit so excuse me but is it what i think is like what do you think that people get wrong about writing about place or thinking about place you know what do you what do you think that makes it difficult or hard to do because for me if I see those little spaces, if I say I'm in a new dimension, if I say I'm in a different place and I embrace it, it makes it easy to write about. But what do you think people should do or, or, or they think about? What makes it difficult to do this? I think from a, from a writer's perspective, for me, I think what, what, what is, uh, I just lost my train of thought. So. <laughs> Yeah, I go to do a, an intro that I forgot what I was going to say, but um, oh, uh, fr from a writing perspective, it, it can be hard sometimes to, um, to, to let go of your preconceived notion sometimes of a place. So, um, so, so one, of the, 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 uh, one of the things I'll often do is, is try to bring other people into those places so that I can see it through their eyes. Kind of, you know, I talked about earlier traveling around with my daughter a lot um, around a lot of places and um, I can enjoy places in a new way, um, um, places I might have been before that are, are just brand new. Mm. Um, but uh, from a, I know what I was going to say about writing. From a writer's perspective, often what I see wrong, problematic is that you, somebody will spend too much time on the descriptives. You know, here's what the mountains look like where I'm at. Here's the house and here's where it's placed and other relations to things. And, and that's important to create a picture. But I think what creates a more powerful picture is to tell a story about the place. You know, you can describe the the you know the the iconic uh, looks of the of Riverside, you know, like the mission, and you can describe the architecture. But you could also just tell stories about its its creator, and you could tell you know some of the stories about the haunted ha house and you know, beneath the in the catacombs, and um, you know those are really what you want to tell people about when you talk about place. I think is those stories you know um uh, not just that it was saved but who's the person that saved him and and why did that person save a, a particular historic place you know i the last couple of books i've written have, have uh have touched on um, historical places and, and places of interest and one of the things i've discovered you know i'm going to go back to people again i think is that just going to be a recurring theme for the rest of the hour um but those places are all important to us and we only know about them because some people decided to preserve them or kept the records or kept vigil over them until they were useful again to people. Um, and I've seen that at that repeated time and time again. So um, uh, when it comes to getting place right, um, one of the things we want to do as, as, as consumers and also as creators is to really focus on the stories um, behind why they're important in the first place, you know. Um, you know, Disneyland's interesting, but the story of how Disneyland came to be is even more interesting. And some of the early uh, employees and creators behind Disney are really the story. You know, the 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 structure in the park in Anaheim is 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 someday going to go you know dissolve into the ground again. But the 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 stories of the people can last hundreds, thousands of years, depending upon um, what the future may hold. So, um, getting back, I think your question was, you know. What do uh, people get right and wrong about? Yeah, what do they get right and wrong? I love that though. I love this. I love your idea about bringing people, bringing new people to your place, right? To mm -hmm. your place, you you know, and that's kind of like 
it's almost like you, you don't love someone unless you want to show them something that you love. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you, like you, you, you it's like, oh, well, you got to see these mountains, right? You know, I mean, like that's, so you got to come home and meet my family. You know, you got to see the bridge that, you know, I have memories of, of my first husband when I first came to San Bernardino and he had, he'd been in, he'd been in San Bernardino his whole life. And so for him, it was all about what was changing. Oh, this used to be a Walmart down by the side of that. And oh, this used to be here. This didn't, this wasn't here first. The city building wasn't here. This was a parking lot for the longest time. And I would cut through here to get to school. And, you know, like there's always those stories. And then I have a, a friend of mine. Um, I've known her for 20 years and she lives here in San Bernardino. And I find myself doing the exact same thing with her, right? You know, like, I, you know, like, yeah, you know, where did they move that Walmart? Like that's the, where the Smartin final's not gone. Well, you know, you can't get from San Bernardino Valley College, you know, back up to baseline on Mount Vernon anymore because they cut up. And why did they do that? I was so mad that they cut that off because I used to, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's really fun to do because you have this shared language, right? And so like, if we're thinking of place as community and place as people and places sort of like, dimensions and showing something new we can also think of it as language as a mm. certain language right right knowing where things are and knowing how people do things right you know or knowing that's place as well so like if we're looking at like i think we focus on the description 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 but it's not necessarily just that it's how do things work in that particular city right you know um are the malls you know there's a there's a, a charter school or there was a charter school in the mall right I want to know that story I want to know about Hardy Brown right I want to hear that right I how does how why is this here at this point and not at where did the arts walk come from in in uh, Riverside like what you want to know how things work, what language people are using in that city. And I think it's important to get some of that in with the descriptions, of course, because sight, sense, sight, sense, sight, sight, sound, touch, smell, taste, all that sensory details is important. But you want to get in the little tiny moments, right, um, that people don't, don't see. And I think your technique of having someone look at it with new eyes is a really, really good way to write about place and to give yourself that to write about place. So I, I don't know. I, I, I really, I really, I really, really love that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like the, uh, the, you know, it's, it's easy to get nostalgic about place too, which is, uh, and, and I guess maybe bringing new people in is a, is a remedy to that. Cause you'll have new experiences there. You'll, you'll also be sure to tell them I had a, a, a I grew up in this area, and so some of my friends still live in this area, and I went to visit a buddy of mine in East Vale, which isn't too far from here, from where I'm sitting in Riverside, and um, he's talking to me, he goes, yeah, do you, you know, right around the corner is where we used to go drinking in high school, like there was a famous uh, street we all used to go to and drink on the, on the weekends in high school, and it's literally around the corner from his house, which is part of a giant subdivision, which is part of the sprawling Eastvale community, which is moving into Mira Loma in Ontario, right? But, but like, you know, it, it's also the place where, you know, a bunch of high school kids used to get drunk every Friday and Saturday. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, no, that's, that, that is, you're absolutely, and you don't know that unless you're there. You yeah, and there's no marker to, to indicate that. There, none of us are famous enough to have a, you know, um, so-and-so, uh, drank to excess on the spot in uh, 1985. <laughs> exactly, but yeah. you have to be in the know. And I peeked at the chat, just peeked really quickly at the chat. I was kind of looking at it and they were talking about when we say things like up the hill, right? Oh. I have to go up the hill, I have to go to Victorville, right? So up that's the hill how I know. Yeah, well, that's how I know it, right? But that's the thing. You have to be down here to understand what up the hill means. And even in like, in, I don't know where you're at, but in Riverside, up the hill for me means I go to Mission Grove. <sighs> See, so it yeah. changes, that language begins to kind of change. And I think that's really cool. I remember 
um, he was my a professor, Wando, he was also a literary laureate as well, Wando Gatto. And he said to me, he said, you know, um, we tell, we, we say that we're going to get there in time. I'll be there in 20 minutes. I'm 20 minutes away. I'm 15 minutes away, as opposed to I'm 10 miles away, right? Or, you know, I'm 25 mm -hmm. miles away. And I thought about that, like, that is so cool. You know, like, why, why do we put it? Because the traffic, freeways, you know, all of these 10 miles is, is nothing. But in Santa Cruz, because I lived in Watsonville, which was only about five miles away from sort of the city where I worked, on the number one freeway, it, you know, it was five miles would be really, really, it would be traffic. So it'd take about 25 minutes just to get up those five miles. And everybody said, oh my God, the traffic, it's terrible, it's horrible. And I'm like, it's 20 minutes, y'all. <laughs> like, like, this is nothing to me, right? It's 20 minutes. I'm coming from, to get to one side of San Bernardino to the other side of San Bernardino, you know, it's gonna be 45 minutes, you know, it's gonna take some time, right? But it's just really interesting how that also is something I think you should get into your writing when you think about place. and. And you know, get those little. I, I that makes me interested, right? Yeah, Owen, yeah, go ahead. I know what else I wanted to ask you about place, because um, the other important thing about place is not to just you know talk about the great things about place, but the but the bad things as well. I, I'm somebody. I don't know about you, but I believe to fully love anything, a person, a place, an idea, you need to love the bad parts of it, the negative parts of it, just as much as the good parts. So. Do you struggle with that? Do you have to remind yourself to think of the negative or do you, do you, are you able to be in that space, you know, or is love different for you on, of places? Well, that's a good question. That's a really good question. You know, um, would you mind terribly if I read a poem? Because I, I'm yes. thinking so much of this is answered in the poem. And so I had initially chosen a poem I wrote for Riverside, City Birds. Um, but I, I was looking through my work and, and I found a poem that I wrote for San Bernardino um, a few years before that. And I think this answers it because there's, there's something at the end, count it all good, that you know really answers that question about the good and bad that happens, right? Yeah. So if you guys don't, if you don't mind, I can just kind of please really quickly. Okay. I always like when poetry breaks out. It's never <laughs> been a, it's never been bad yet. Well, I, I'm a poet, so that's that's a warning. I may break into spontaneous poetry. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> happened, but, yeah. yeah so there's no medication for it. Sorry. <laughs> I hope not. So this yeah. is 2017, um, and I wrote this for Inlandia Institute. Each neural. So perhaps it's not about pain. A body is created by other bodies, a life fabricated of events and dust and curling could haves, dids, the little boy mimicking the walk of a man he wishes to be, the girl singing and dancing in the car and being caught by the boy and them on the hill making without thought this baby, the lady, pushing the basket down E Street, three children riding one in front, two below, mounted on dirty clothes, and she screams to make them laugh, running down the incline. And this is what they remember about the house in San Bernardino, the one in Muscoy, though it's long gone, a freeway now, I think. Or was it Riverside and the corded lights and the big black bug at the Ram Museum that made mama jerk back and drop her purse and Yes, we did have those good burritos where that gas station was, where daddy used to like that time. And I get quiet thinking about the doctor wrenching out his breathing tube. But you are already talking about the library, always the library. The library I take you to, jumping up and down and riding the elevator again, just for no reason at all. And you keep wanting the names of the streets the names of the things, the details, your chest so open and ready that I am tempted to make it up, but I don't because I still know how to get to the freeway from here. 
you were born in the parking lot at the old San Bernardino County Hospital before they turned it into Arrowhead. And you were born in a writing workshop in a basement rented out that took so many years to learn how to speak. And I believe we all hurt and healed here. Once the wind blew through a dark house and I looked out the windows wishing for home, my body made up of those dirty valley mountains and that grassy dark coiling around me. Once the sound of you giggling as I tickled you so alone, piercing my sternum, rolling with shaky wheels up to a peak to keep the softness sealed. But here now, it is your turn. And I think I did the prompt wrong, but what was that thing that he always said, count it all good? Count it all good. That and more, better. Write it as I see it, capture it. Each little scrap by scrap, each neural, each piece of here, home. Wow. Thank you. Love that. So it kind of answered your question without even like, you know, like there, there was pain. I was a young mother, right? That that was painful and beautiful. Like it captured the the beauty while experiencing pain and the joy and your perspective and your child and the other people. It uh, yeah, it's amazing what you can do with a place if you choose to care about it that much. You yeah. know. Yeah. yeah. And 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 there's the people, right? Because it was, it's the relationship with the family members you know, because um, there's joy with the children and my children and all the fun things we did. And there's pain with the children, and, you know, and, and, you know, being alone so much or so much. Yeah. Time. And having, trying to have joy while you're seeing pain and, and feeling pain while you're experiencing joy, you, you have to do that to be a human in these places. You can't, Absolutely. now I'm going to be happy. Now I'm going to be sad. It's... And, you know, Larry, I wonder if it's that it's about the place witnessing the human condition, which is what makes it so powerful and something we need to think about or write about, right? Yeah. That in it, all this stuff around us is just witnessing us being human, the mountains or the trees or, you know, all the things that we're looking at or we're writing about or the ways that people are, are collecting themselves together, right? It's just a way to witness us witness us together you know what i'm curious about though you had mentioned joan didion and i really want you to talk about that because i was not familiar with that and so and i i just i just i want you to bring her into this space and kind of talk about what you thought about that story and about it being about here which was so cool well the um a couple of things about uh joan didion that um that I realized, you know, she recently passed. And, and when she did, one of the first things I thought of was in Landia's first anthology, <clears throat> which featured uh, one of her pieces. And um, when you started with your poem, the imagery of the family when the car baby carriage and, and walking along, uh, I think you said E Street, um, that is similar to how Joan Didion introduces San Bernardino and the story she tells about a, it winds up being a, a murder, uh, but it starts with that imagery of a woman and it starts with a carriage and it starts with walking in the seats. So, so boom, right there, there's a nice, uh, there's nice energy uh, between those two pieces. But um, she also wrote about, you know, she wrote about a murder. She wrote about the, the negative downsides of, 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 of our community. And, um, and one of the things as a writer, I always wanted to do is like, I remember being in college and taking an LA literature class and I'm like, why isn't there an Inland Empire literature? There's no, you know, there's no canon of books, you know. One of the cool things about Inlandia is that that is being cultivated and, and enshrined in a formal way. Um, and, and there's just so many more stories to tell. Um, one of the things that I struggled with, uh, with Secret Inland Empire is I was writing about a region and defining what belongs in it, not just what people belong in it, but geographically, what's the size of it, um, culturally, what are the practices that are part of us and not part of us, but they happen to be here, those 
types of things, you know. Um, uh, but but uh, one of the, the the fun things is really trying to figure out how to incorporate all of the uh, broad things that you want to say about a place without um, going on for 15 pages, you know. So putting it into a poem uh, is a really good way to solve that that dilemma. You can put a lot of rich feelings and and visuals that you can't get in most other ways, uh, but but through the poetry. Oh, so. wow. oh yeah. No, and now you got me thinking about this this word canon, right? And in the yeah canon of of work of of poetry because we've got like Keenan Norris, brother and the dancer. And that's that's here, right? You know, there was Joan Didion, we've got Susan Strait, and she's got a lot of books that are kind of kind of focused on here. And I'm thinking about this now in the light of like, you know, have you, you ever heard that term like, okay, that's kind of an LA book, right? Yeah. You have like that's an IE book, right? That's an inland empire book. And just the ways in which we express ourselves not just through the uniqueness of this place but the uniqueness of who we are and what we're doing and and that's 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 values right that's a talk about like who we are as as values like i don't know i don't know I, i'm just i'm just kind of sussing this out a bit but it's it's it's, yeah. it's something you definitely want to feel out it's um, I actually, um, in the introduction to Secret Inland Empire, I really tried to capture that. Um, and from a writing perspective, the, va the, the, the neat thing about writing an introduction is you have to be brief. Mm. Um, but in the book, I'm writing about 90 places and I'm writing about a place that's basically two counties and four million people. Uh, but I'm gonna put it in an, a short introduction. So I tried to do that. And, and maybe you can see how I you know, touch on some of the values uh, while trying to highlight some of the great things about this place. So, and also without excluding people, which is um, in my line of work is easy to do. It's easy to tell certain stories and not others. Um, so <laughs> I'm gonna do it. I really like tech, by the way, just technically speaking for writers who wanna present the way you did it was great. You're reading it from your computer screen. So if you've got your face, I'm gonna do it a little more old fashioned. I'm gonna read it from a paper book that I folded in front of me. Yeah. Um, so, through my bifocals. Yes. All right. So this, this is the introduction to Secret Inland Empire. Uh, where exactly is the Inland Empire? Rather than answer that question, this book attempts to share a picture of the Inland Empire based on its shared values, experience, and culture. Lines on a map offer little useful information. Borders are merely choices, and this book chooses to ignore those and instead cast a wide net to capture creative cultural expressions as diverse as the people of the IE. If, however, you prefer geographic maps over philosophical ones, consider the Inland Empire to include Riverside and San Bernardino counties, and maybe a step or two beyond. Where is the Inland Empire? It's where you least expect it. What does the Inland Empire offer? Well, for starters, mountains with hundreds of trails for hiking, skiing, and mountain biking, and deserts that hold some of the IE's oldest artifacts and plenty of its wonderful artistic creations. Our national parks and preserves will ensure that what's offered now will be available for future generations too. Working behind the scenes, IE scientists are literally saving endangered species while engineers continue to tinker and invent contraptions that sometimes confound but often improve living conditions around the world. Who are these people? They're the Native Americans who settled these lands thousands of years ago, as well as the Indians who were forced here. They include the Californios and the Americans, as well as the immigrants from Central and South America and Europe. The promise of health and wealth and security in the Golden State attracted the industrious, the creative, the far out and the weary. This place called to them and they responded by moving here and dragging friends along and creating new things together. People of all creeds arrived with big plans and shovels in hand to turn some soil and all of them left their mark on this wondrous place. <laughs> that's wonderful Thank that you. is just wonderful I love this idea of like those questions you ask right like you know where does it begin where does it start what is it you know like you, you're you're drawing us in to really think about like these demarcations and these things that 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 we create around us but what makes a place that's a huge huge question to, to ask but you know what you made me think of 
I, mm-hmm. I listened to this podcast. This was N.K. Jeminson, and she was talking about like speculative world building and whatnot. I got science fiction on the brain for some reason, but she, she was talking about world building. I have that on your brain. I do. I really do. But she talked about how when she was a child, she went to, um, I believe it was in Sweden. Um, she went to kind of a far off place with her father who was traveling. And she was asked, um, she noticed that the way that Americans introduced themselves was what do you do? What is your job? right like what what kind of thing that you do but she noticed that the way that the people there introduced themselves was where i'm from like what i'm a part of and so when i was listening to you and 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 thinking about you know the people that make up this place and and the activities and the ideas around them and the scientists who are studying things and the mountains and the you know and the and the the trails and all the wonderful things that you talked about about how that becomes a sense of identity for who we are, right, mm-hmm. too. And, and I don't know, I just think that that's a beautiful way to think of it, that it's not just um, a ciliary, it's not just outside of us, but it's actually who we are. And so when we're writing about place, we're writing about a piece of ourselves, too. So it's another way that we can kind of think about it if you want to. <laughs> I, do. I like to think about pieces of ourselves becoming part of the place and part of the place becoming pieces of us. You know, there, there's a conversation that's going on between us and our places at all the times, right? We're giving and receiving. Yeah, yeah, a conversation. So we're writing about it, but we're really just having a conversation. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that idea that we're always talking and talking to everything around us and, and ourselves. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, well, this, this, that's awesome. <laughs> hey, you guys. Hi, Katie. Hi. You know, I, I am so with you there on we are. I think we make the place. We make, you know, the place is us. The stories make the place without us. You know, what is it? Um, so we've got a couple questions right now, and may, we might have a couple more in the Q&A. So how about we try and get to those? The first yeah. one, um, when writing about places that are on the smaller side, how do you balance being authentic about that space with how your readers who are from that space view it? That's a good question. Mm-hmm. You want me to take it? You want me to take it? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, you can add in some stuff too. Sure, I'll jump in. So you want to balance. You're writing about a smaller place and you want to balance and you want to be authentic. So authenticity has to start with you. You are the master of your own experience, right? It is how you feel it. But if you want to bring in other voices and you want to be careful to say, hey, I'm not just making this about my opinion and myself and whatnot, then say it openly, right? This is what these other people think and feel and believe and, and want. And then your, your opinions, your ideas can either be pushed against that or aligned with that however you want. So I think having those multiple voices, having those multiple experiences makes it, makes it richer. Um, So I would say just get it down on paper, just write it, um, and then go with what feels right. That's, I know, I know that's not a good, (laughs) that's That's not a good, a good, a good tip, but you know, but yeah, just balance. You, you, you got this, you got it, you got it. Yeah, I think, I think the mistake that I make when I talk about places that are smaller than where I'm from, I'm thinking specifically about, about how many times we refer to the desert of the deserts of the Inland Empire, like Joshua Tree is a place I regularly go to. Um, uh, and and there, there's an art installation. I, I go there too often, and it's actually a small place. It, uh, it's art that you have to get on the ground and look at under bushes. Um, so that, that really helps the ego stay in check. And I was mm-hmm. thinking when you're writing about a smaller place, you don't want to just be marveling at how different they are or quaint they are. If you start feeling you're doing that, you're probably doing a disservice to wherever it is you're, you're describing. Um, uh, so I, again, I think you just um, um, 
you don't want to be simplistic in your explanations, but you want to be simple in your perspective of what you're looking at. You want to take it in and see it for what it is uh, and not try to draw too many conclusions about what that says about the people necessarily. Um, I think I often get things wrong when I, oh, they have this thing, then this is the community they must be, you know, um, you know, pick your affiliations and you can very quickly just go down a rabbit hole and, and it's uh, in good and bad ways. So, yeah, I would say you've got to be careful with that. The, the unconscious bias of an inferior place because it's smaller is easy to get into your writing. Mm -hmm. I like that. I really like and that's, that. And that's probably why I had such a chip on my shoulder about writing Secret Land Empire. It's like, man, they, they did a disservice to us in LA literature. The only time they talk about us is when they got to go bury a body in the orange grove somewhere in Pomona. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that we're more than that. <laughs> <laughs> but I felt the same way. For when we edited that anthology uh, for, for San Bernardino, you know, the San Bernardino Sings anthology, I, I felt the same way because it was like, wow, nobody talks about San Bernardino, right? San Bernardino has such a bad rap. It's not that bad. There's good people in San Bernardino and you want to kind of showcase that and you want to kind of push that, push that, that forward. But, but it is interesting. It is interesting to kind of find, to have to find that balance and press down on that ego a little bit, not to make the judgment, right? To, to feel an experience, but maybe um, erase the judgment from that feeling and from that experience. I like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what that makes me think of is not overgeneralizing and not wanting to reinforce negative stereotypes um but then you do have to balance it with accuracy you also don't want to sugarcoat everything um so how do you make it real um without uh you know making it real but making it inviting um so the next question is uh do you have favorite writers who represent place yeah who 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 do you know in your writing lives that write about place that you mm. that you turn to i would say i i mean you in the introductions here susan Strait is one of those uh um and a great thing about susan Strait is she's a local writer but she's no her stories are known nationally as well she's and her writing is known she's a um, she's from Riverside. She's about Riverside. She's incorporated Riverside in more ways than I can see in most writing. Um, but um, so I really love her, her, her books. And, and she looks at the, at the not so great sides of things and still finds the beauty in them. You know, you know, her, you know, one of the books I read a couple of years ago is you know, the protagonist is a, is a prostitute on the streets in the middle of, of the day, but then looks through a palm tree and sees the beauty of a, of a light fixture going through it. And, uh, you know, that there's no better example I can think of of seeing the, the not so great side of the place you love and loving it. You know, there's Susan really captures what it's like to um, see something with your, your eyes open and still love it after you've seen it all. Um, and I think that's a good community if you can do that and the community lets you. Um, oh yeah, like I, I'm, you know, this is such a hard question because there's so many different influences from so many different places. Is it a poet? Is it a science fiction writer? Is it a, you know, is it a memoirist, you know? Um, and I think about like, you know, James Brown in the LA Diaries and this beautiful memoir that he wrote and he's all in LA you know but it's it's all about his family and the dysfunction that's going on in his family and the ways in which he engages with the different members of his family and how that book acts as a sort of love letter in some ways to them right but it is about LA it is about this very seedy side of Los Angeles, you know, at that time in the 80s and in the 90s and, and, and drug addiction and, and all the things that, you know, that that comes with. And then you think, yes, but I am entranced by the stories of the family that's there. So, you know, so I mean, so that's, but that's a memoir, right? But if I look over on the poetry side, um, 
oh my god <laughs> like you know like they're just poets uh natalie graham um she's in fullerton which is a little far, further out but i mean some of her poems are just gorgeous in that they really are centering us in this imaginary place this sort of place of a fairy tale right that we're so familiar with fairy tale we're so familiar but she's she's changing them and turning Cinderella into something different, right? Into someone different. And I think she's writing a, a fiction um, a novel um, and she's doing the exact same thing with that in which she's bringing in, well, she's from Florida. She's bringing in the swamps and the bayou and she's bringing in the traditions and the people that are there from there. So it, it's, it's here, you know, we have, we have, uh, Juan Delgado and we have Keenan Norris and Alex Espinoza um, did a beautiful book called Stillwater Saints and it's not based here but he kind of used Riverside as a as a way to 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 make a map of of this imaginary city that he made up and yeah. you know, so you know so those are those are some names if you want to look people up and and read about them um, but, oh I just yeah. I so I friends of ours that lived in Riverside moved to Philadelphia a few years ago, just came back over the holidays. And one of the things we sent to them was Isabel uh, Quintero's book, um, yes! Poppy's, My Poppy Has a Motorcycle. Uh -huh. And they read that almost every night, they say, and it reminds them of Corona, reminds them of that place that they haven't been to for two and a half years. Like, and it really takes them back to that place. And it connects with all of these, these neat memories for them. And and so uh, uh, she wrote a book that really connected at a, at a meaningful level with, with people who, who know this place and are no longer here and want to remember it. And uh, so, so writers that can accomplish that for the, um, are those expats, do we call them expats? When they expats. Left? <laughs> yeah. You're not an expat yet. You're, you're close. You're, you're like, you got dual citizenship or something right now. But yeah. we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep an eye on what you're doing every community. couple of years. I got Make sure that community. you're still in the empire. Yeah, and Romaine Washington, that's another person too, who's also very, very um, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful poet. And she can do the same thing. I think she had a series of poems about, about the, the Carousel Mall, right? And about the changes that the Carousel Mall went through. So, I mean, just, there is something that is so good about reading landmarks and reading places that you know and you see there's just something that just feels warm and fuzzy about reading something and then it's it's that your city it's your street it's you know it's a place that you've been to so you know Definitely. That, that's another thing yeah so look them all up look all these yep. people up. <laughs> so you know i think that's a really good place for us to end because i have just a couple things to announce before uh, we go um, it is humanities hour, so we are trying to stick to about an hour. Um, but the reason that these authors have been invited to speak for this is because they write about place. So Larry and Nakia, please go look up Larry and Nakia's books. Um, also, you, you mentioned Susan Strait. Uh, Susan Strait and Doug McCullough will be uh, our guests as part of this series as well as Isabel Quintero and Cassandra Lopez. And also uh, our next guests on January the 19th will be Rebecca K. O'Connor, who is a falconer and she, uh, her day job, is, well, she's also a writer, extensive writer, but she also works for Rivers and Lands Conservancy, uh, conserving open spaces. And Teresa Ryan, who, uh, most of us know her as a dog warist. She writes dog memoirs that are, are funny. Um, but her most recent book takes place at the Sycamore Canyon Preserve, which is a giant that. open space and which is, you know, um, under the auspices of the Rivers and Lands Conservancy. And you know, so let's, we're going to talk about open space. We're going to talk about Corona and what now and then we're going to talk about um, all, all kinds of, of place, but people make the place and the stories make the place. So, you know, thank you both 
Larry and Nakia for your stories tonight, for your insights. Um, this has been truly wonderful and enlightening. Um, I also would like to again thank the Riverside Public Library for inviting us to be a part of their Humanities Hour programming. And like the library, this activity is supported um, in Landia's portion, is supported in part by an award from the California Arts Council, a state agency, as well as California Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. So uh, join us again on January 19th. And until then, um, go uh, write, write about place, <laughs> look around. <laughs> Appreciate the place that you are, which might just be your living room for the next couple of weeks or your office. So until then, we will see you and stay safe. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care, Nakia. Bye, Katie. Bye. Bye. <laughs>